in difficult times, there is a real test of a person. See, anybody can be revolutionary when the situation is revolutionary. Anybody can be revolutionary. It is more difficult to be revolutionary when the conditions are not revolutionary. When people are filled with reformist ideas and reformist delusions. There was this impression that Marxism was dead, socialism was dead, and by extension communist parties um, were dead as well. And in fact, we know that some communist parties actually did disappear. You can't kill an idea. And the idea of people having a society in which the means of production are not owned by a parasitic class, that idea is uh, you can't kill it. A lot of us came out, you know, kind of battle scarred. It may suffer defeat, setback, but ultimately, in the competition between capitalism and socialism, ultimately, socialism will win. Well, we live at a, a moment in human history when it's quite clear capitalism has absolutely nothing left to offer the people of this planet. This is a class war! Change is definitely in the air. You might say that we were a little bit ahead of our time. We are going to fight like hell for every single policy I've read here and some that aren't here. The party has a real history of struggle in this country. We are a revolutionary party striving to win the people of this country for socialism. I remember very well going to my party club and meeting comrades, uh, some of whom were in the Mackenzie Papineau brigades fighting against fascism in Spain, uh, people who uh, were in the, the forefront of uh, building the trade union movement. When I think back on my life in the party, it just seems like a blur. We were involved in so many things, almost every major campaign. When I joined the Communist Party of Canada in 1959, the Cold War was in full state. Taking our country out of the camp of imperialist war and fitting it into the camp of peace and progress towards socialism. I feel I've never been anything but a member of the Communist Party. I believe in socialism and I believe that when you attain socialism, you should defend socialism. A movement that isn't just through time, and our party has a hundred years and I'm part of that hundred years, and that's what feels significant to me is this connectivity to, to history, but also through space. Vive la solidarité internationale! You know, it's not just a rhetorical slogan to say that we really are an internationalist movement, that we are one large family worldwide. My roots are in India, my head is in Canada, but my heart is in Canada. Jim uh, uh, continued the fight for national liberation for the indigenous peoples right up to the end of his life in the late 1960s. Uh, he's an inspiration for all of us who have Métis families in our backgrounds and uh, uh, for all party members, in fact, that we've been in this struggle for almost our entire century. I was infused with that worldview, you know, like which class do you belong to? And there was quite a campaign quite a campaign. Someone asked me, why are you running? Uh, is it to raise issues or do you want to get elected? And I said, I want to be elected. The party has made it possible for me to follow my star. That is to say, to devote my life to work for my ideal, for socialism. And how many people have an opportunity to give every day of their lives to work for something they believe in? I'm, I'm telling you that it's the it's the party of the future. It's the only party that they can actually save the world, in my opinion. For 100 years, the Communist Party of Canada has been at the forefront of the struggle for socialism. It is a party of the working class and stands for the emancipation of all humanity from capitalist exploitation and oppression, colonial plunder, imperialist war, 
poverty, and ignorance. The Communist Party of Canada is not only Canada's second oldest political party, it is very nearly as old as socialist internationalism itself. On November 7, 1917, the Russian Social Democratic Labour Party, or Bolsheviks, led tens of millions of workers and peasants in a successful revolution, grabbing the attention of the world and changing the course of history. For the first time, a socialist government had seized and now held power. The Russian Revolution was a threat to capitalism worldwide, and Canada was no exception. Across Canada, the socialist movement grew a pace of revolutionary progress abroad and deepening contradictions between classes at home. But while many Canadian workers affiliated with communist parties in the United States, there was no communist centre in Canada until May of 1921, when a group of men and women declared the founding of the Communist Party of Canada. In the words of Tim Buck, who would become General Secretary of the party in 1929, the idea of a party aiming to meet the standards developed by the genius of Lenin was achieved by revolutionary Canadian workers and intellectuals under the direct inspiration of Lenin and the Bolshevik party. The labor movement is the organized working class. It's not the whole working class, but it's the organized working class. And it's like a training ground for class consciousness. The labor movement by itself would never take up the fight for socialism. The labor movement, if left alone, would be economism, what Lenin called economism. The fight for wages, better working conditions, a bigger beast of the pie. Marx and Engels and people like Lenin injected ideology into the working class. So the role of the party in the trade union movement is linked intrinsically because it's the communists who will give the later labor movement politics and direction. And the labor movement, like I say, is a breeding ground for class consciousness. So it becomes a very important component in any social movement or revolutionary movement. But, but the ideology has to be carried into it. And that's the value of the communist party. That's why we call ourselves the vanguard party not because of our size, but because of the importance of scientific socialism and what we can bring into the struggle. But socialists weren't the only people observing the Russian Revolution with interest. In 1917, the Government of Canada had expanded the War Measures Act to outlaw left-wing organizing, clearly concerned about a homegrown revolution. Thus, under surveillance and duress, the first Congress of this party of a new type took place in secret on a small farm of five acres outside Guelph, Ontario. In Fred Farley's barn, delegates from centres across the country met at great risk with an appointed sentry on the lookout for police. Out of this mix of disparate yet related economic, geographical, cultural, ethnic and social backgrounds of town and country, out of these men and women shaped by personality, temperament, education, physical and intellectual condition, youth and age, was formed the first generation of the Communist Party of Canada. Alors évidemment, sa fondation euh, à Guelph, dans des conditions de clandestinité, le Parti communiste euh, reconnaît l'existence d'une euh, nation canadienne-française. Euh, on retrouve, dès la fin des années 20, des documents officiels du Parti euh, qui justement souligne la nécessité de euh, recruter auprès des de la classe ouvrière euh, francophone à travers le pays, mais en particulier au Québec. Euh, et ça, ça dénote évidemment d'une préoccupation euh, particulière euh, au sujet de la, de la question nationale. Et évidemment, ça porte fruit puisque le Parti communiste euh, est très actif dans les années 20-30, en particulier après la, la, le crack de 1929, très actif euh, à Montréal en particulier, mais aussi partout à travers le Québec. Well, my grandfather came out to Port Moody when he was seven years old and walked up the Port Moody Hill with his dad who had arrived before him. 
started out in the uh, Flavel Cedar Mill out in Port Moody and used to deliver party papers around Port Moody area. Um, he ended up in a big strike out at uh, Millardville and ended up being the, uh, the strike spokesperson, you might say. And uh, out of that, his popularity grew and he ended up becoming the founding president of the IWA. Most of his friends were fellow travelers, people in the Communist Party of Canada. And when he founded the IWA, he was going back and forth down into the States and speaking in front of two and three and four and 10,000 people all the way down to Louisiana, organizing the IWA. Um, it really, really built a foundation for working, you know, people that a lot of us don't really know that in today's working world about the foundations that were built back in the 30s, the 40s, and the 50s. And uh, when, he, when he became the president of IWA, the International Woodworkers of America, one of his cohorts was the founding president of the Longshore Union, Harry Bridges. And Harry Bridges was the founding president of the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen's Union. And together they sat on the first CIO with John L. Lewis in as the president. And Harry was a fellow traveler. My grandfather was in, you know, the party. The boss hounded them. The government hounded them. The CIA hounded them. They tried to throw Harry out of the country, I don't know how many times. He used to come up to Vancouver in the 60s, 70s and sleep on our couch out in the East End and tell me stories about what it means to be a working stiff your whole life and what it means to be exploited. One thing that I've really recognized over my lifetime is how influential the party was on building unions, not only in Canada and British Columbia, but also down through the United States as well. And a lot of that was really built upon internationalism about recognizing workers around the world. Mine mill, longshore, loggers, city workers, boilermakers, uh, mill workers, they were all represented by members of the party here in you know, BC. So there was good collaboration and, and interaction, not only for reform for working people, but also for the bigger perspective about um, you know, nationalizing key sectors of the economy. And the party was the only uh, union that's actually called for that over its proud history of this 100 years. This party would draw from the rich ferment of anti-war and labor organizing in cities across the country and the recent memory of general strikes in Winnipeg and Vancouver, coal miners' strikes in Alberta and Nova Scotia, and hundreds of industrial disturbances in opposition to the First World War. More than 350,000 workers went on strike between the years of 1917 and 1920, and thousands of them came to the Communist Party over the next decade. Many of these founding members were immigrants who faced xenophobia in their everyday lives and deportation as a consequence of organization, and yet were undeterred from the urgent work of organizing revolution. The person that signed me up was named Harry Hunter. And Harry Hunter was the original employee in Canada from the Steel Workers Organizing Committee. It was formed after the split with the FFL when the CIO was formed in the late 30s. And the uh, head of the miners union, John L. Lewis, met with Williams A. Foster, a prominent American communist at the time, because he needed organizers. And William Foster said, we can provide 400 organizers from the Communist Party of the USA. So John L. Lewis hired 400 organizers, and they formed the Steelworkers Organizing Committee before there was a Steelworkers Union. And Harry Hunter was the first employee in Canada of the Steelworkers Organizing Committee for the CIO. And they worked on organizing uh, Stelco. Actually, the first local union in Canada was local 1004 was at Tefasco. That local was broken, and Tefasco is still not organized to this day, but the successful organizing was in Stelco. 
and uh, the prominent people working for the Steelworkers Organizing Committee at that time were a guy named Harry Hamburg, Harry Hunter, and Bert McClure. They're all members of Local 105 IBW. They were all electricians. And the IBW local was part of the AFL, but they defied the AFL and they took part in industrial organizing and took part in the Trades and Labor Council in Canada. So these people were icons. When I joined the party, they were still very active, prominent members of the party. So I've had that connection with the past generation, which I'm very thankful for. And these were very wise people. And when I joined the party, the collective of the party was very strong in industry here in Hamilton, uh, particularly in the United Electrical Workers Union, which represented UE and three factories here. Peggy McClure acted as a secretary for all these people. And that was an unpaid job. So the party was very prominent and important in the industrial unionism that developed particularly in Canada after the Second World War. We have also played a big role in the struggle for women's rights. When the others were not as keen about that question as they are today, there's been a revolution in thinking in that, we were formed women's labor leagues in British Columbia and raised up the whole question of equal rights for women in the 30s. And our party has a proud record of trying to organize women and men and women to participate in the struggles and to fight for equality. Occasionally I look through some files and I find pictures of the kids at three, four, five, six <laughs> on the picket line. Uh, you know, our children were all raised the same ways and some chose to become activists in the labor movement and the party. Others didn't, but they all know which class they belong to. <laughs> we tried to organize a union so people could have a representation in the life and what was happening to them. We succeeded in Vancouver to organize uh, a legal office I was working in. Throughout the late 20s, communists helped to establish the Industrial Union of Needle Trades Workers as part of a massive movement to organize the unorganized and to advance the rights of women within labor. As organizer Annie Buller, a founding member of the Communist Party, would explain. The dressmakers could not persuade the officials of the International Ladies Garment Workers Union, then looked upon by the workers as a company union, to organize them and help abolish these frightful conditions. The so-called leader's reply was, you cannot organize women. Thus, in 1929, the dressmakers took their destiny into their own hands and started to build a union that would defend their living standards and abolish the outrageous sweatshop conditions. Not just a movement, but a significant movement, a powerful movement, a movement that has actually accomplished certain achievements. I mean, they made International Women's Day um, come to the fore in in places like Canada and the United States. And that didn't happen just out of the movement here. It came from an international movement of communist women through the in Women's International Democratic Federation, which our movement in Canada was part of. The Congress of Canadian Women were part of the uh, Women's International Democratic Federation, which had consultative status at the United Nations and played a significant role in fighting for women's rights around the world. On Thursday, October 24th, 1929, the stock market crashed, and the Communist Party of Canada sprang into action. On the prairies, communists organized the Farmers' Unity League to propagate a clear pronouncement of the class struggle within every existing organization of farmers. Shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder boycotts of farm sales became a show of collective strength. At these attempted repossessions, Neighbors stood strong, and no bid would exceed a dollar. As auctioneers and landlords became increasingly enraged, bankrupt farmers would have their belongings restored on the spot. In Winnipeg's North End, the Workers and Farmers Cooperative Association operated a fuel yard, a lumber yard, a public garage, and two dairy plants uniting and organizing the unemployed. 
In January of 1930, the Communist Party established the Workers' Unity League, a militant trade union federation that would organize thousands of workers. In 1934, there were 189 strikes across the country. 109 of these were led by the Workers' Unity League, and 84 ended in victory. These were years of hard-earned successes and grisly repression, as the Workers' Unity League was virtually alone in pushing for union action during the brutal years of the Great Depression. In Estevan, Saskatchewan, the RCMP opened fire on striking miners, killing three people. Annie Buller spoke to a room full of miners, ringed by police, whom she called cowards to their faces. That yellow stripe on your pants goes right up your back. Buller was charged with inciting a riot and sentenced to a year of hard labor. Her only crime was telling the truth in the fight for working people. While in solitary confinement, Buller smuggled letters to her son, written on toilet paper. And as soon as she was released, she resumed organizing. They were all great people. I loved traveling around the province. We had uh, people who were very important in the National Farmers Union. People who were influential in the Métis movements, uh, leading people in the trade unions in Saskatchewan. They were all people who had been through really uh, inspiring, difficult struggles, and uh, they had a lot to teach me, and I, I loved being there. In 1931, a number of high-profile Communist Party members, including General Secretary Tim Buck, were charged with sedition under Section 98A of the Criminal Code, introduced during the Winnipeg General Strike of 1919 to ban unlawful association. At the same time, the state seized the assets of the Association of United Ukrainian Canadians, the Federation of Russian Canadians, the Finnish Organization of Canada, the United Jewish People's Order, and others, immigrant organizations with strong socialist affinities and close ties to the Communist Party. In February 1932, Buck and seven other leaders of the Communist Party were imprisoned in Kingston Penitentiary. Their trial and subsequent imprisonment, during which Buck survived an assassination attempt in his cell, was dramatized in the 1933 play Eight Men Speak, a passionate indictment of the repressive government of R.B. Bennett. The play was censored immediately after its first and only performance in December 1933. The Kingston Eight were released separately over the course of the next year, and finally, on November 24, 1934, Tim Buck walked free on a single day's notice, arriving in Toronto to a reception of 25,000 working people at Maple Leaf Gardens. The Great Depression raged unabated through these years. The month after Buck's release, a two-month strike commenced in Vancouver, British Columbia, as men converged upon the city in response to the abject conditions of government relief camps throughout the province. By April 1935, over 1,000 striking workers, organized by the Workers' Unity League, set out for the capital on boxcars. The On to Ottawa trek had begun. By June, the convoy reached Regina, where trekkers were attacked and blocked by police. An agreement was made that eight representatives of the group would continue on to Ottawa, while the rest of the strikers would remain in an encampment on the city's exhibition grounds. In Ottawa, the delegation was insulted by Prime Minister R. B. Bennett, and they returned to a fraught situation in Saskatchewan. Police provoked a riot and violently suppressed the trekkers, arrested 140 and injured hundreds more. But this watershed event accelerated an irreversible movement for work and a social wage. The trekkers' fight for unemployment insurance goes down in history as a moment of collective strength and ingenuity. issue because it's changed significantly for the worse. Yes. Not that it was very good before, but we've never been involved 
directly in the U.S. dirty war. Yes. And everyone knows that the election that was held for President Maduro was one of the cleanest elections of any country in the world. But they can't hide that. There were international observers there. And they don't like the election because they don't like the result of the election. And that's what, and that's what this is about. But this is also part of a bigger project for U.S. imperialism. They are not just looking at Venezuela. They're looking at all of South and Latin America and the Caribbean because they cannot stand, they won't stand, for governments and peoples who try to exert their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, their right to choose their own government and choose what kind of economic and social future they want for themselves. So enough is enough and Canada has to stop this. It's got to, if they're not prepared to step back, because of public pressure and demonstrations like this one, and we have to come back again with more people and make sure they know this is a sentiment of the Canadian people as a whole, then we're gonna to have to change the government. It's time. We need a government that will have a foreign policy of peace, disarmament, and that will recognize the rights of other countries to determine their own future free of intervention from the US and from Canada. And what do we say? Hands off Venezuela! Hands off Venezuela! I had met in my life the greatest humanist on earth, and it is Fidel. I shook hand with him, and he, he had some words with him and from me, and he did, did ask. I've been told you are very passionate in Cuba. Why? Then I told him, because it is the revolution. I am revolutionary and communist. It is the revolution which is I find is the very dear to me because it is a third world country revolution and it embraces Asians, Africans, and Europeans, and thus it is very unique for me. If anybody asks what is the most meaningful practical work I did, it is solidarity with Cuba. And I have already said on one occasion that I am, my roots are in India, my head is in Canada, but my heart is in Cuba. I also think too that meeting comrades around the world who have made uh, the ultimate sacrifice, whether they have been jailed, whether they have been imprisoned, tortured, or unfortunately killed for their beliefs, only solidified for me that it has often been communists with an international perspective who have led the charge, the demand for human and civil rights, the demand for equality, the demand for socialism on a global scale. The Communist Party of Canada has been internationalist from the first. As the Spanish Civil War between Franco's fascist coup and the Popular Front government escalated in 1936, more than 1,500 Canadians joined the fight, many of them members of the Communist Party of Canada. The Mackenzie Papineau Battalion fought in many key battles and suffered great losses which remain uncommemorated by the Government of Canada to this day. Party member Dr. Norman Bethune offered much needed medical assistance, innovating a mobile blood transfusion unit that saved thousands of lives. Bethune would go on to volunteer with Mao Zedong and the Chinese Communist Party in their struggle against the Japanese invaders, where he would die after an infection contracted during a battlefield surgery. But his words and deeds live on today. Our wars of aggression, wars for the conquest of colonies, then just big business? Yes, it would seem.
seem so. However much the perpetrators of such national crimes seek to hide their true purpose under banners of high-sounding abstractions and ideals, they make war to capture markets by murder, raw materials by rape. They find it cheaper to steal than to exchange, easier to butcher than to buy. This is the secret of war. This is the secret of all wars. Behind all stands that terrible, implacable god of business and blood whose name is Profit. Money, like an insatiable Moloch, demands its interest, its return, and will stop at nothing, not even the murder of millions to satisfy its greed. Behind the army stand the militarists. Behind the militarists stand finance capital and the capitalist. Brothers in blood, companions in crime. These men make the wounds. It seems to me that in these elections today, that we must keep in mind the nature of the time in which we live. These elections in your country and other countries may well determine the whole future of our world. What is the nature of that world, a world that has been built on a struggle for the common people? A world which has just almost smashed the forces of fascism, which, however, are attempting to emerge again and strange to say, emerging with the help, with the help of some of the great leaders of our time, who in the first stages said pretty words about the destruction of fascism. I need call no names, but we must be careful in our own country, in England and in your Canada. And there can only be a realization of the kind of world we want if we send to Parliament those who have a record of uncompromising fight for the people in the largest sense. Such a person is Tim Buck, a man who has suffered all the way for the things in which he believes. Yes, a man who stands for people taking over their own destiny, one who stands firmly for the cooperation of all the allied nations, for a complete understanding between the peoples of Canada, for example, and the allies who have fought in this war, especially with the Soviet Union, one of the leading nations, again, in the struggles, in the struggle for democratic principles. I trust that you will send Tim Buck to your parliament and let him fight for you. Over the next decade, the Communist Party made remarkable gains for working people in a political system from which they were officially excluded, operating as the United Progressive Movement or as the Labour Progressive Party. In the 1930s and beyond, Communists like Jacob Penner in Winnipeg and Harry Rankin in Vancouver would advance a working-class platform in city council. And in 1940, Saskatchewan organizer Doris Nielsen became the first communist elected to parliament. In her first speech to the House of Commons, she charged that While over 50% of the voters are women, we can only have one representative of our sex in the House. I remember Stanley Ryerson being at our house, uh, I must have been seven years old. And he came for a meeting, and uh, my father introduced me to him. And uh, he signed uh, his book, Le Canada Francais, uh, dedicated it to me. I still have the book. Um, there's a funny story about uh, Stanley Ryerson. Um, uh, around that time, maybe a little bit earlier, he was a candidate for the party. Uh, I'm not sure which name the party was using, uh, depending on the year. But up in uh, Quebec City. And here, Blanche Zedinard 
was his, uh, I guess, campaign manager, which meant there was the two of them in the campaign, I guess. So they were doing some door-to-door work in, uh, in Quebec City. And uh, somebody uh, got wind of it. Some of the fascists up there got wind of it. And they gathered a crowd and started throwing stones, chasing them and throwing stones at them. And they had to literally run for their lives. And uh, they managed to get around the corner and they, they knew someone who worked in a funeral parlor. So they ran into the funeral parlor and the person hid them inside a coffin, the two of them inside one coffin. And the crowd came actually right into the funeral parlor. And the person had to, you know, respect for the dead and all of that, get out of here. But they still hung around outside because they knew, they figured they had to be in there because they just disappeared after turning a corner. So to get out of town, they actually had to take them out inside the coffin in the hearse. And it's not an exaggeration. I heard the story from both parties, from uh, both from Blanche and from Stanley years later at different times, and they both told it exactly the same. So, quite a little, quite a little different way to camp, doing elect, election campaigning in those days. As the party gained in strength, the ruling class continued to drum up anti-communist fervor by any means. In 1937, Quebec Premier Maurice Duplessis introduced an act to protect the province against communistic propaganda known as the Padlock Act. Named for the confiscation of meeting spaces by law enforcement, the Padlock Act was wielded by the state against communists and non-communists alike to hasten deportations of recent immigrants and to terrorize religious and political groups. This signaled one of the lowest points during the Cold War in Canada. Le Parti communiste, loin d'être ce qu'on dit dans nos livres d'histoire, ce qu'on nous apprend au Québec, c'est dans ces années-là, dans les années 30, 40, 50, c'est vraiment une force fondamentale. Il n'y a pas un syndicaliste, un ouvrier au Québec qui n'a pas eu à un moment ou à un autre, euh, à travailler avec des communistes. Le Parti communiste est vraiment un parti massif à cette époque-là. C'est aussi le parti qui lutte contre la loi du cadenas, c'est un parti qui lutte pour la démocratie. Euh, et, euh, et donc, c'est vraiment un parti euh, qui a une influence euh, très importante dans les, dans les masses populaires euh, au Québec. Et c'est pas pour rien, d'ailleurs, que Maurice Duplessis, euh, en 36, impose la loi du cadenas. C'est vraiment pour freiner la propagation de l'idéologie communiste et euh, qu'il voit vraiment comme une, comme une menace. Second World War, the Communist Party called for a popular front against fascism. But at the outset of the Cold War, the world was cleaved anew, and the capitalist class renewed its persecution of the global left with vigor. As McCarthyism intensified in the United States, its Canadian accomplices escalated attacks on communists. Évidemment, parmi les communistes qui sont illustrés au Québec, on peut pas euh, passer outre l'exemple de Fred Rose. Fred Rose était, euh, était en fait, demeure jusqu'à aujourd'hui, euh, seul, la seule personne à avoir été élue sous la bannière du Parti ouvrier progressiste, qui était le nom légal du Parti communiste euh, à, à cette époque, euh, au niveau fédéral. Euh, et en fait, il n'a pas été élu seulement une fois, il a été élu une deuxième fois. Une première fois en 1944, euh, dans une élection partielle, et une seconde fois en 1946, avec encore plus de votes qu'en 1944, et ce, malgré le fait que les autres candidats s'étaient ligués dans une espèce de coalition anticommuniste anti-Fred Rose. Euh, donc ça prouve que, euh, en fait, Fred Rose bénéficiait de l'appui des euh, citoyens et des citoyennes de, de, du quartier ouvrier dans lequel il, euh, il s'était présenté. Le quartier, c'était euh, la circonscription, en fait, s'appelait la circonscription de quartier à l'époque. Et dans cette circonscription, on comptait euh, plusieurs usines, des usines d'ailleurs dans lesquelles les communistes étaient très actifs euh, au niveau syndical. Euh, évidemment, Fred Rose, euh, après sa réélection en 46, euh, est accusé. Et d'ailleurs, c'est un des, des, on reconnaît ça encore aujourd'hui comme l'un des, des débuts de la, de la réel début de la guerre froide. Euh, Fred Rose est accusé par euh, donc euh, par le gouvernement euh, d'être euh, un espion à la solde euh, de l'Union soviétique. 
entre nous, on va pas se le cacher, je pense que s'il y avait, s'il y avait fallu qu'il y ait euh, des espions soviétiques au Canada, ils auraient trouvé des bien meilleures couvertures qu'être le seul, com seul communiste à la Chambre des communes. Mais bon, euh, et non, non seulement ça, mais en plus, donc dans un procès euh, qui est éminemment politique, euh, d'ailleurs euh, Fred Rose n'aura pas droit d'enquête d'avoir euh, n'aura pas droit à une enquête préliminaire euh, parce que pour avoir droit à une enquête préliminaire il fallait que le procureur général de la province euh, donne son accord et à cette époque le procureur général de la province du Québec était nul autre que Maurice Duplessis euh, premier ministre d'extrême droite finalement euh, qu'on reconnaît qu'on qu connaît tout le monde comme euh, le, le, le maître la, le chef de l'époque de la grande noirceur euh, mais euh, toujours est-il que le, le, outre euh, ces, ces procédures euh, judiciaires, le, le procès est éminemment politique, c'est vraiment un procès anticommuniste et euh, on veut vraiment s'attaquer aux communistes euh, et à leur influence et donc euh, Fred Rose va être condamné, à, va être envoyé en prison, il va faire six ans de prison et après ces six années-là, ne trouvant pas d'emploi, euh, il est obligé de s'exiler dans son pays d'origine, la Pologne. In all my acti activities in unions, I'm rubbing elbows with communists here, here and there, and I've got quite an interest in it, in it all. And uh, I, actually, what brought me into the party was in 1968, during the Dubček si situation, I met a union meeting. There's a motion on the floor put, up, put there by the, by the executive to condemn Russia for having invaded Czechoslovakia. Um, I got up to speak against, against the motion. I said, I think most people in this room are, are socialists or see themselves as socialists. An awful lot of you belong to the NDP. And I believe in socialism and I believe that when you attain socialism, you should defend socialism. Well, the roof came down then, the red baiting was rampant from, from there on in. So it was the day after that that I called up Sam Hammond to say that uh, I'm ready to join the party now. Since its founding in 1936, the communist-led Canadian Seamen's Union had fought to improve the dreadful working conditions of sailors and dock workers. In 1949, however, the Canadian government conspired with American unions to install notorious gangster Hal Banks within the rival Seafarers International Union, breaking a national strike and permanently destroying the CSU. Hal Banks was a known gangster, but he was also a real redneck anti-communist. And he was brought here knowing that he was a gangster and set up an office down just off Pender and Seymour. And my dad walked me by that office in the 50s. And there was a sign in the window that said, I'm here, or this organization is here, the SIU, to smash communist unions in BC. It was overt. This was a dramatic prelude to a decade of suppression, as throughout the 1950s, communist-led unions were expelled from the Canadian Congress of Labour, and red clauses were added to expel communists from unions headquartered in the US. When they were readmitted into the Canadian Labour Congress in the 1960s, right-wing social democracy was in control of the CLC and its affiliates. That was the time when the right-wing leaders in the trade union movement, the Liberal and CCF leaders in the Trades and Labour Congress of Canada, and the CCF right-wing leaders of the Canadian Congress of Labour were expelling left-wing unions right and left, and expelling communists and left-wingers from elected positions in the trade union movement. People like Harold Prochet, Harvey Murphy, Charlie Stewart, and Jack Phillips. I remember at that time, uh, when this was taking place, uh, Sam Laurent, who was the Prime Minister, was asked, why don't you in Canada pass some legislation like the Taft-Hartley Act in the United States, which would ban communists from holding positions in unions. And his reply was, the unions are doing a good job by themselves. We don't have to do it. Because the boss had his representatives in right-wing government, you'd expect, you'd expect intrigue and you'd expect pushback from governments and, and the people that they represented were the owners of industry. 
But in my grandfather's case, and in a number of other unions, but more specific to Harold Perchette's case, is that not only was he harassed by the McCarthy era, he was also harassed by the white bloc, it was called, in his own union. And when my grandfather ran for two conventions, he was, the first one was by acclamation, he became the president, the founding president. The second time around, I think he got 75 or 78% of the vote at a convention. The white bloc only ever got 12 or 13 or 14 percent. So the white bloc, this was union members that wanted power and intrigue and wear a bow tie and smoke a cigar so badly, they sided with the government and the bosses to get my grandfather excommunicated from being able to go over the border to take his rightful place. And he would have won that third election and probably the fourth too because he was such a good organizer at the grassroots level. The red clauses were effectively dropped after John Severinsky, a steel worker in Port Colburn, and Jim Bridgewood, an auto worker in Oakville, ran on the Communist Party's ticket in the 1972 federal election. Communists are usually elected in trade unions, especially at the lower levels, at the shop floor, even during the worst McCarthy eight days. Communists were elected as shop stewards and representatives. They're isolated in the leadership of most of the unions. But at the bottom level, the workers, you know, workers are very pragmatic. They know who represents their interests. So they, they had to put up with the Cold War and McCarthyism, but they still elected communists at the, at the ground level where they, they need representation every day. I believe that's still the case. With the founding of the Canadian Peace Congress, the Communist Party would lead the fight for disarmament and mutual security, demanding the outlawing of nuclear weapons alongside other signatories of the Stockholm Appeal as a Canadian affiliate to the World Peace Council. And sometimes when people say to me at the end of a speech, Tim, you used to talk like a revolutionary. Now you talk like a pacifist. I, I say to them, well, isn't that a very funny thing? The pacifists don't know it, but they are becoming revolutionaries. They're becoming revolutionaries because to the extent that they help to prevent world war, they are keeping the road open for the advance of socialism. When I joined the Communist Party of Canada in 1959, the Cold War was in full state. But uh, there was a bit of a turn. There was a bit of a turn, especially in English-speaking Canada. There was coming to be a peace movement more than just communists and Quakers and a few other Christians. And at the University of Toronto, we succeeded in getting quite a, a, a significant movement going. It called for candidates to withdraw from its nuclear alliance, NORAD, with the United States. Uh, and there was quite a campaign, quite a campaign. In fact, uh, it actually it influenced not just our campaign in the University of Toronto, but the campaign in the country influenced the Diefenbaker cabinet, and they uh, resisted... U.S. nuclear overflights during the crisis over Cuba in 1961, and indeed the placing of nuclear tips on Bomark missiles stationed in Canada. These, you know, these issues were not new, but for some reason, it had it had finally sunk into people like the the danger, you know, the mortal danger of nuclear weapons. And suddenly there was this great upsurge of peace organizations and, and peace demonstrations and so on. So there were, you know, there were organizations like, you know, doctors for peace and nurses for peace and engineers for peace. And, and, um, not too long after I joined the party, uh, there was a major event, which was the, the walk from Cold Lake. Like at that point, the, the Canadian government had agreed to, you know, cruise missile testing over Alberta. Be, this is 
because the terrain of Alberta was sufficiently similar to the terrain around Moscow, right, that they were going to test these you know, self-guided missiles. Um, so there, there was a, a, a walk, you know, like a, a protest march, where people started walking from Cold Lake to Edmonton. You know, that's hundreds of miles. So it took several weeks. And each, you know, they walked along. Each place they came to, you know, in the evening, they'd hold a meeting, a local public meeting, you know, explaining the issues. And it started getting quite a bit of press attention. And so when they reached um, Nemeo, you know, several hundred more people went and joined in with the march as they came into Edmonton. And when they got to about 140th Avenue on 97th Street, about another thousand came and joined in and marched down uh, 97th Street to, to Churchill Square. So so there were thousands by the time, and then there was another five or 10,000 waiting in Churchill Square. There was really an upsurge of the peace movement during that era. And the party, of course, party members were deeply involved with that, involved in many different individual organizations and involved in the, the, the various you know, coordinating com committees and, and umbrella groups and so on to uh, like that you know, that march from Cold Lake basically that was uh, you know, that was party members idea that they started pushing it and promoting it with the different organizations in an era of national liberation the communist party of canada unwaveringly supported democratic anti-colonial anti-imperialist and socialist struggles around the world in south africa Palestine, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala, Grenada, Guyana, Chile, and of course, the Soviet Union, China, Cuba, Laos, Vietnam, and the DPRK. Throughout the 1960s, the Communist Party pushed for an independent and democratic Canadian foreign policy of peace and disarmament, opposing the imperialist wars in Korea and Vietnam years before the countercultural consensus. The communist movement uh, and the Communist Party in Canada particularly took up the uh, struggle of the Vietnamese people just as uh, part of, as we have done in the struggle of uh, peoples all over the world in their fight for independence and democracy, just as we supported Spanish democracy and the Spanish war. And uh, uh, in the case of Vietnam, we decided in, to send a delegation to Vietnam to go there, to hold discussions, and then to come back and to tour the country and tell the people uh, of Canada what was really going on in Vietnam. And so in December of uh, 1965, uh, Tim Buck and I and uh, Ray Murphy, who was then the editor of the Canadian Tribune, went on a delegation to Vietnam. From the YCL, I went on a delegation to Cuba as the YCL leader. I think that was around 1973, 74, the early days after the revolution in 1961. A uh, very nice delegation of five of us who visited different cities. Very, very impressive. I came home thinking, we have a socialist country right in our backyard. And it was wonderful. The, later, I did become involved in Cuba solidarity work, and that's been over 40 years since the uh, organization in Toronto of solidarity, the CCFA in Toronto, was founded. So Cuba solidarity is more very important. I'm mentioning this because it's part of the communist ideology to support our fellow workers in other countries. Standing in unconditional support of the self-determination of all nations, the Communist Party fought for indigenous rights and sovereignty from its early days, calling for a just settlement of indigenous land claims and decrying the genocidal actions of the Canadian state. Communist Party member and Métis leader Jim Brady was instrumental in the founding of the Métis associations of Larange, Alberta and Saskatchewan, organizing cooperatives throughout the Alberta settlements to build Métis autonomy after the revolutionary example of Louis Riel. Jim Brady uh, was one of the, the first Marxist uh, Métis organizers in Saskatchewan and Alberta, the 1920s and 30s, a uh, member of the Communist Party. He was uh, one of those people who brought to life 
the the Marxist theory on uh, the national question, our understanding that indigenous peoples were oppressed nations within the Canadian capitalist state. Uh, he helped take that from a theoretical level to a practical level. Uh, he and Malcolm Norris were among the, the Métis leaders who fought for the establishment of Métis colonies, uh, pieces of land controlled by Métis people in Alberta during the Great Depression. Uh, this was one of the, the first cases where the land mass that had been stolen from Indigenous peoples in this country in some form was actually returned to their control. Uh, not in a complete way or a comprehensive way, but it did uh, mark a, a truly transformational moment in terms of the understanding of the, the struggle for land, that it was not going to be inevitably simply the theft, unending theft and destruction, uh, that there was the possibility of struggling for a different kind of future. I've always felt that essentially, when you consider the Métis Rebellion, they were, in my opinion, actually an expression of what we would consider to be a national liberation movement. I still feel that as far as a North American Indian is concerned, there will be no real advance for him until that national liberation movement is carried to its completion. If you look back at uh, you know the last seven, eight decades, any time there's been a significant uh, uprising of struggles among Indigenous peoples, the Communist Party has been there primarily in a role to win wider support within the trade union movement, the other sections of the population for those struggles to help put political pressure on governments and the courts to recognize the validity, uh, whether it's fishing rights, whether it's hunting rights, uh, whether it's uh, uh, the struggle to win uh, you know, upholding the treaties that have been signed in the past to stop breaking those treaties, uh, whether it's new struggles today uh, to return lands that have been seized illegally in the past. So you look at, uh, you know, the Oka, uh, summer of Oka in 1990, for example, right across the country, communists were involved in uh, setting up solidarity camps, uh, helping to get resolutions passed within the labor movement, publicizing it in our newspapers. We did uh, a tremendous amount of work to help win the people of this country for the understanding that this was uh, an important solidarity struggle that they had to take part in. Not just uh, another fight against injustice, but something much more fundamental to the nature of this uh, capitalist country with its colonialist roots. Ah, anti, anti with the founding of the Parti Communiste du Québec in 1965, the conditions for the French and English-speaking working classes to deepen their solidarity were strengthened. The members of the PCQ are also members of the Communist Party of Canada, but the PCQ has a special status based on the recognition of Quebec nationhood by the communist movement. In 1972, communists played a decisive role at the Canadian Labour Congress Convention, in which communist delegates and delegates from Quebec won the convention for recognition of Quebec as a nation. Puis, euh, évidemment, dans les années euh, post-guerre, le Parti communiste euh, donc se crée en 1965, le Parti communiste du Québec, euh, en tant qu'entité distincte au sein du Parti communiste du Canada, et c'est ce qui permet, entre autres, euh, plusieurs expériences, une, une, plusieurs liens avec les différents euh, partis de gauche qui se créent dans les années 60-70. Euh, évidemment, c'est là aussi que le, le, le parti met de l'avant sa, sa il lutte pour euh, une constitution québécoise qui ferait partie, mais euh, tout ça dans le cadre d'une nouvelle constitution canadienne euh, et que le, le parti euh, mobilise beaucoup autour euh, de la nécessité d'une nouvelle constitution, d'un nouveau pacte euh, et un partenariat égal et volontaire de toutes les nations euh, à travers le Canada. Et c'est ce qui fait que, par exemple, euh, pendant la crise d'octobre 1970, le Parti communiste du Canada est le seul parti qui va... Euh, euh, qui va avoir l'audace de dire que le, les causes profondes de cette crise, euh, c'est pas nécessairement les, les, les terroristes du FLQ, mais euh, les aventuristes du FLQ, euh, dans les termes qu'on utilise, euh, que, que le parti utilisait euh, dans, dans les déclarations à cette époque. 
Euh, mais c'est vraiment le, le fait que la Constitution canadienne ne reconnaît pas le Québec comme nation, donc, ne, et à plus forte raison, ne reconnaît pas son droit à l'autodétermination. Euh, puis évidemment, le parti est le seul parti communiste du Canada et le seul parti pan-canadien à cette époque à, à mobiliser euh, les salariés, les, les progressistes de tout le pays, euh, et en revendiquant le droit à l'autodétermination pour le Québec. Uh, be worried about uh, weak need people who uh, don't like the looks of, uh, of a at, at any family. cost? At any cost? How far would you go with that? How far would you extend that? Well, just watch me. During the crisis of October 1970, the Communist Party was virtually alone in opposing the War Measures Act which led to the military occupation of Quebec and the detention of hundreds of innocent people. Communists were on Parliament Hill and in cities across the country protesting on the day the act was invoked, despite the imposition of martial law and the suspension of civil and democratic rights across Canada. In the referendum of 1980, and again in 1995, the Communist Party supported Quebec's right to national self-determination, advocating for a democratic solution to the crisis of Confederation, a new constitution based on an equal, voluntary partnership of the nations in Canada, each with the right to self-determination, up to and including the right to independence. Whether opposing the post-war Abbott Plan, the Canada-U.S. Free Trade Agreement of 1988, or the catastrophic NAFTA Accord, the Communist Party of Canada has struggled for economic and political independence from the United States, protected the rights of immigrants against xenophobic policy, and defended the working class against North American monopoly capital. Today, the Communist Party continues to oppose the USMCA, as a corporate constitution that drives down wages and sets worker against worker in a race to the bottom. With the advent of neoliberalism at the end of the 1970s and the election of Brian Mulroney in Canada, the Communist Party was often a lone voice against policies of free trade, tax cuts, privatization, deregulation, and the evisceration of labor and democratic rights. This was a decade of bitter confrontations with the forces of capital, including austerity governments from across the political spectrum. Yet the communists stood strong throughout. During the Canada-wide general strike of October 1976, the Communist Party worked at every level of the labor movement to shut down plants, factories and workplaces across the country. When BC's social credit government introduced its draconian restraint budget of 1983, slashing social services and attacking collective bargaining, workers fought back, and the Communist Party was amply represented within the Solidarity Coalition. In 50 years that I've been in the party, we have seen the complete breakup of the colonial empires, their disintegration, and the liberation of hundreds of millions of people in the colonial world. When I joined the party, there was only one socialist country, and it was laboring through five-year plans to overcome much of its backwardness. And it's a country that was maligned every day by the media and by right-wing politicians. We saw in the achievement of socialism in the Soviet Union as the beacon for the future as the example for mankind. We realized that it was the beginning of a whole historic transformation that was bound to grow no matter what imperialism did. And 50 years have certainly proved that. Today, the socialist world is growing in might. It accounts for 25% of the world's production. Today, just contrast socialism and capitalism. Today, in the socialist world, if you read the Soviet press and the press from the other socialist countries, the whole energy and effort of their country is directed towards improving and increasing the standards of living of their people. There's, every year, there's recorded progress and uplifting of the economic and the cultural and social life of people in the socialist countries. And contrast that with the capitalist countries. 
It's not so many years ago that they talked about capitalism being a system that will last forever because we've discovered the welfare state and the capitalist system will keep giving people more and more material goods and a better life. Today, what are they telling the working people in every capitalist country, including here in British Columbia? They're telling you that you've got to make sacrifices to save the system. And capitalism is going in reverse. And at some point in history, that process is going to become evident to the majority of humanity. The, the example between a declining capitalism and growing socialism. You know, when I was sitting at the BC Federation of Labor Convention, a lot of many of you were there as delegates. This last one, the, United, the Unity Convention, which met to discuss the solidarity issue and the right-wing program of the government. And I thought, I don't know how many of you got similar ideas when you're sitting at that convention. Here were representatives of every industry in the province of British Columbia. Here was the real power in BC. There isn't a wheel that would turn. There isn't a board of lumber that would be produced. There isn't a pound of coal that would be produced. There isn't a railway train that would have run. If the people in that hall had made up their mind that they wanted to exercise that power. I thought if that group sitting in that hall made up their mind on the kind of legislation British Columbia wanted, they had the power to go out and get it, despite the opposition of that gang that sits in Victoria. <laughs> and what does that prove? It proved that there exists in society today, in capitalist society, a force, the working class and its allies, that are powerful enough, strong enough, to be able to carry through social change, which we were not able to carry through in the days when I joined the party, despite the big unemployed struggles. And what's lacking? The concept among that audience and the working people that they don't have that power. They don't yet recognize that they have the power, but they're not yet ideologically prepared to use that power to establish themselves as the ruling class, which ultimately, though that's the social force that will come to power in this country. But that force exists in Canada today and in our problems, and we saw it at that BC Federation of Labor Convention. So tremendous strides have been made in the 50 years since I joined the party, and I'm sure that many more strides will be made. With the dismantling of the Soviet Union, the global communist movement lost its lodestar, the world's first and oldest socialist state. 
As communists around the world strove to understand the counter-revolution, a faction in the leadership of the Communist Party, led by George Hewison, sought to abandon Marxism-Leninism altogether. Veteran communists across the country held strong in a four-year-long struggle against the liquidationist line and policies of the Hewison Group. Before it was finally defeated, the faction had gained control of the Central Committee, attempted to seize the party's assets, and engaged in several waves of expulsions, ending with a demand that the membership sign loyalty oaths at the end of 1992. The struggle ended with the liquidationists finally leaving the party, with some of its assets including the party's newspaper and just 15% of the membership. At the 30th CPC convention, the party's commitment to Marxism-Leninism was reaffirmed, and Miguel Figueroa was elected as its new leader. How could we think that the Communist Party of Canada would be immune yeah. from a global crisis and a global shake that happened when the Soviet Union was dismantled? The inner party crisis in the early 90s uh, took a big toll on our party. Uh, not only did we uh, lose members as a result of the crisis, a handful of which, of course, were liquidators, but many others as well who were confused or uh, upset about the paralysis for over two years in the party. Uh, and so that was a big impact on us. Of course, we also lost financially. Um, bank accounts had been stripped. Um, our headquarters at 24 Cecil Street and other party properties uh, were... Uh, essentially taken away from us. So we had to start from scratch organizationally. We also had big challenges organizationally in the sense that um, many of our clubs needed to be reactivated, in some cases they needed to be reorganized and so on. But the biggest toll was the fact that together with everything that had transpired um, internationally, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the and the you know the reversion of capitalism in most of Eastern Europe and so on, um, there was this impression that Marxism was dead, socialism was dead, and by extension, communist parties um, were dead as well. And in fact, we know that some communist parties actually did disappear. We didn't. We kept the party going and strove to rebuild the party. But there was this general impression that the Communist Party was no more. Uh, and on top of that political impact, um, we found out in uh, the uh, late uh, spring of uh, 1993 that the Mulroney government had introduced uh, new legislation, amendments to the Canada Elections Act, uh, which essentially uh, created conditions for the um, banning of our party. In 1993, the Communist Party led the fight against conservative amendments to the Canada Elections Act, which aimed to eliminate small parties from participating in elections, except as independents. Unable to register, parties would not be able to raise funds, issue tax receipts, or campaign for public support. This would be the fourth time that the Communist Party was effectively banned and had its assets seized only by bureaucratic rather than outright repressive means. Party leader Miguel Figueroa launched a charter-based legal fight that ended before the Supreme Court of Canada after two appeals. The Supreme Court of Canada ruled unanimously that the offending sections of the Elections Act were unconstitutional, forcing the government to enact significant changes. That decision, known as Figueroa v. the Attorney General of Canada, marked an important victory in the struggle to democratize Canada's electoral laws to the benefit of the public and all small parties across the political spectrum. The case, interestingly, was called the Figueroa case. And the reason it was called the Figueroa case was that the, the party, once it was deregistered, had no standing. We weren't a, um, a charitable organization. We weren't a non-profit organization. We were a political party. And once we ceased to be a political party in the eyes of the government, in the eyes of the uh, Canadian legal system, um, we had no status at all. So, in fact, it was Figueroa on behalf of the members of the Communist Party versus the Attorney General of Canada. That victory was very significant. Uh, of course, it didn't qualitatively change the nature of the, the bourgeois electoral system in this country, um, but it, it did um, provide some space 
for uh, the, you could say, the democratization of the electoral system uh, and to create a bit more of a level playing field. Of course, we know that money comes into it, uh, other perks that exist for the large, um, particularly the, the parliamentary parties uh, in, in, in Ottawa. Uh, but nevertheless, it was a very uh, important victory and, in fact, uh, set a precedent for a number of subsequent judgments uh, both uh, at the level of the Supreme Court, but also uh, in provincial courts and whatnot, uh, referencing uh, the Figueroa case and the, the judgment of the court uh, on that case. So these were um, these were part of uh, the struggles that we undertook to rebuild the party in the immediate aftermath of the crisis. I think that that period that many uh, people in Canada won't remember because they weren't politically active. I think we have not only pushed through that period, we've rebounded from that. The movement is growing. The movement is not embracing Marxism-Leninism as if it's a dogma, but that as if it's a scientific world view that needs to help guide us. And so if I trace my own thinking from 1986, when I was very impressed with what the Soviet Union had managed to accomplish, that was only a small piece of why I felt proud to be a communist. As I travel now to other world socialist countries and go to China and go and talk with other comrades around the world, I know that we're in a very, very different period, that people who would not have looked at the Communist Party's platform, programs, or demands are now asking questions, are willing to look at talking about socialism in Canada. And while it may not be on the front burner right now, our task is to keep socialism in Canada on the agenda, within reach, and within people's understanding that it would be a solution to the capitalism we experience now. Throughout the 1990s, the Communist Party continued to fight against unlimited corporate free trade agreements, tax cuts, privatization, deregulation, attacks on labor and democratic rights and provincial austerity, and participated in countless picket lines, strikes, and demonstrations. During Ontario's Days of Action, a protracted series of demonstrations against the brutal austerity of Conservative leader Mike Harris, the Communist Party participated in mass protests and citywide strikes in 11 cities across the province, some of the largest actions in Ontario's history. The teachers' unions have called an illegal strike. What's in our plan to reform education that could possibly justify breaking the law? Asking teachers to spend a little more time with their students, putting an end to larger class sizes, standardized, understandable report cards, province-wide testing? I don't think so. We live in a law-abiding society. Breaking the law is not the right example. Let's put our children first. In 1997, the Communist Party marched with 126,000 Ontario school teachers in an illegal two-week strike, breaking Harris's attempts to slash school budgets. Party members were active in unions and the community, some in leadership positions. Three were public school trustees at the time, working closely with the unions to stop the government attacks and build the days of action into a province-wide strike. Averted, when the right-wing leaders of some unions caved at the last minute. I ran twice for school board. The third time I won, it was in the city of York. Third time I had learned to get good pictures and good signs and to really go about it. Someone asked me, why are you running? Uh, is it to raise issues or do you want to get elected? And I said, I want to be elected. Uh, it turned out that I was elected. Uh, I was the first communist in Toronto that I know of in this period to be endorsed by the Toronto Labour Council. Uh, and uh, when I was elected, it was really quite a thing to learn how to uh, work with other trustees on the board who had different viewpoints and to learn how to um, raise the issues in such a way to get the attention, asked a lot of questions because I didn't have enough support to get the votes. Uh, but I also worked uh, very closely with the union people because to me, if you're a progressive elected person, 
it's very important to work with unions. Our constituents, many of them are working people and our union people. And so the uh, issues that they face in terms of collective bargaining and working conditions at the schools is just as important. After the forced consensus of the neoliberal 1990s, the 21st century began with some of the largest demonstrations against globalization in the history of capitalism. At the G20 summit in Toronto, generations of communists were present. A few years earlier, in April 2001, the Communist Party of Canada and the Young Communist League convened in busloads upon Quebec City for the third summit of the Americas, alongside 70,000 protesters from trade unions and social justice groups. As police attacked the crowds with tear gas and plastic bullets, the crowd pressed onward, controlling the streets and shaping public opinion against the proposed free trade area of the Americas. Yeah, the YCL has a, a very long uh, and proud history. Um, it was founded by uh, members of the Communist Party um, under clandestine conditions. The, the War Measures Act was, uh, was still ongoing. Um, and throughout its, its history, there's been uh, an ebbs and flows um, there's been points where the, the YCL has, uh, has dissolved and there's been points where it's, uh, it's been a mass organization. Um, but I think like one of the constants is, is the, um, uh, autonomy that the, the party has given the YCL, um, the room and the space for, uh, young people to learn from each other, uh, both, you know, theory, but I think more importantly, uh, how to be involved into the movement, how to be a militant. Um, and so there's always been this um, space and, and opportunity for young people to uh, to grow together and work as a collective, um, you know, under the the guidance of the uh, of the party, you know, and the veterans bringing their uh, their experience, but also with enough you know breathing room to be able to um, uh, change and adapt to the conditions. The Communist Party and Young Communist League marched with the Quebec student strike in 2012 demanding free post-secondary education and the cancellation of all student debt, while working to break the firewall, isolating Quebec students from their allies across Canada. These were difficult years for labour, and the Communist Party stood with workers in moments of triumph and strain, victory and betrayal. In 2009, the Communist Party picketed with steelworkers in Sudbury during a year-long strike against Valet Inco for pensions. And in 2016, Communists stood with the staff of the Halifax Chronicle Herald for an 18-month strike as the newspaper's publisher tried by all means to break the union and the workers' resolve. There wasn't, you know, a lot of uh, organizing or, or protests happening um, in the city I was from during high school. Uh, but on the news, you know, all the time, like there was the, the Quebec student strike, the, the I Don't Know More movement, uh, BLM. Um, and so we we're seeing all these things and we, you know, we were excited about them and we want to take part of them. Um, and then going, you know, to, to Toronto, uh, for my first like YCL schools, um, and getting to meet people from like across the province that had been engaged in like big, uh, historic victories, like passing BDS resolutions, um, on their campuses, uh, taking pay part in the, uh, the Quebec 2012 student strikes. Um, and organizing in that movement. Um, so it was amazing, you know, coming in and, and coming to these schools where, you know, it wasn't just like, uh, Mark said this 200 years ago, but it was like, no, no, two months ago, we, you know, took part in this action. We spoke to these students. We got them out to this rally. Um, and it was, you know, it was really exciting. From the struggles of Mi'kmaq fishers to Wet'suwet'en land defenders, the Communist Party has rallied to Indigenous nations' struggles against ongoing colonial oppression and dispossession, connecting working-class movements to Indigenous self-determination as a matter of international solidarity. Where capitalist accumulation pushes ecosystems to the brink of collapse, and the climate asserts itself as a field of political struggle, Generations of communists the world over raise a time-worn banner with renewed conviction. Socialism or barbarism. As a global pandemic announces the next capitalist crisis, millions of people across Canada face unemployment, impoverishment and the threat of eviction. While sharpening contradictions between classes recall the social and economic turmoil of the Great Depression and a new Cold War looms on the horizon, the lessons of history are remembered. 
preserved by the party, tested in struggle, and constantly developed alongside the needs and experience of the working class. For 100 years, the Communist Party of Canada has held strong to its program of proletarian internationalism and socialism, and as the crises of capitalism mount in the present, its future is assured. The Communist Party remains Canada's party of scientific socialism, tempered by a century of rich history with many more years of growth and struggle ahead. In the gloom of mighty cities, midst the roar of whirling wheels, we are toiling on like chattel slaves of old. And our masters hope to keep us ever thus beneath their heels. And to coin our very life's blood into gold Thank you.